This is the first lecture on motion models and animation. We'll cover 4D coordinate systems, motion models and key terms, which deal with sampling, keyframes, interpolation, controlling movement of objects in space and time using paths, which can be straight, segmented, or splines, and then introducing rates of change. The hope is that as we move forward, we'll be able to um, move objects in space and time. We'll look at moving cameras later in the week. Motion models and animation um, uh, assumes spatial and temporal sampling. Uh, in the illustrations produced by um, uh, Bill Mitchell and Malcolm McCullough, Look at pixels, voxels, and hypervoxels, right, as you begin to increase the complexity, adding the fourth dimension of time. Pixel, an xy point, a voxel, a volume at x, y, and z, and a hypervoxel, which is uh, a voxel that actually has a movement attribute as it, over time, can move from t1 to t2. We know that uh, we can, or we should assume, that we can animate both the translation of, and the transformation of three-dimensional geometry over time. That time is visually communicated with an animated picture, which actually is a sequence of two-dimensional images or frames that are displayed in a fixed order. When you think about the movement of a hypervoxel, we can, in these terms, now go to hypersolid. We're looking at the movement of that solid from the background to the foreground over a series of four frames, right? Thus, they're collapsed on top of one another, right? Those four frames implying the movement of that object over space and time into a movie or animation. If we're going to begin to, um, I guess, animate objects in space, uh, we have to address or understand the difference between spatial and temporal uh, sampling. Spatial sampling, <laughs> whoa, spatial sampling actually looks at the beginning of the object at T1 and to its next location, um, uh, T2 and so on and so forth. Temporal is the amount of, let's say, time intervals between the movement of an object between T1 and T2. If you have too many samples, you will have a jerky movement of the object. Too few, jerky movement. Too many, well, too many, because you do know that the human eye, right, will actually begin to, impl um, it will infer and imply, our brains will understand it as a smooth movement between T1 and T2. We can communicate, let's say, the boundary location of that solid object with a series of keyframes. A keyframe locks the location or the boundary location of that object at that particular time interval. It's the interpolation between the number of keyframes that actually generates the motion of the object itself. So, if we're going to translate or transform a series of objects, you notice that we can do it simply with position from background to foreground. We can animate the rotation of an object over time. We can change its scale over time. And then we can combine all of them. All right, please note that we can animate materials and so on and so forth. So the complexity increases uh, drastically in this instance. So what's important for you to note is how to configure time, specify the playback rate, as in terms of frames per second. We're gonna stick uh, with the standards. What are those tools for transformation? Move, rotate, and scale. How to assign keyframes or auto keyframes where 3D Max will do it for us and then take a look at the track view, which shows the movement of our object in space and time. So when you begin in 3D Studio Max, number one, you need to configure time. Go to the lower right-hand portion of your screen, you're gonna see a clock with a gear. 
mash on that button and the time configuration dialog box will appear. This is where you establish the frame rate, number two. We're going to stick with the NTSC, which is at 30 frames per second. You can go as low as 24, uh, but we're just going to stick with the standards here. Confirm that that is the case. Three, this is where you're going to set the time model or the length of time within which you will be moving objects in space. And our, for the demonstration exercises, we're just going to use 600 frames. You're going to use um, upwards of 2,500 frames uh, as we get toward the, the end of today's activities. In the center middle top, you see the transformation tools of move, rotate, and scale. Then um, you can look further down here, right? We're looking at the auto key, right? Which is in the lower right-hand portion of the screen and the playback controls. You also need to note right here, we've got frame zero. Make sure that you never animate on any frame on frame zero, any frame other than zero, you can do your animations. Leave um, frame zero in its unfettered uh, state, it's so you can always go back to the model in case you make. All right, we're gonna do a little action to our poor cube here. We've configured the time NTSC, change the frames. Okay, so at frame zero, note that's the slider that shows me where I am in terms of time. Select my object. All right, so I know he starts there. Okay, that's where I want him to start. And then I'm gonna hit auto key here. And then I should be going to frame 600. Ah, uh, frame one. Okay, never mind. so set key. You don't have to do this. And now I'm gonna go back to 600. 300 here in the model and this is where I'm going to move I'm going to move my cube to the center of the action at 300 and I hit auto key and you notice there's a little uh, there should be a little black mark that shows up there in the timeline once the object is selected and that's is where I want it to end notice I've still got the auto key on there it's going to stop there sort of in the foreground all right, so if I move my slider, you know, I'm starting there, moving through the 300 and over. And once the object is selected, you can see that there's little tick marks where I've successfully made a frame. So I'm trying to fix my 300 there. So if you look at the uh, top viewport, you can see my cube moving in space over time in 300 frames. Very exciting. So in this instance, remember, configure your time, ignore the set key, just use move your object, you hit auto key, move your object, uncheck auto key. Hit auto key, move your object, uncheck auto key. And then you'll have three position mistake. Earlier I suggested that we can control the movement of objects using paths. Those paths can be a simple straight line with two vertices. You can have running lines, right, which we know are series of straight lines or segmented a combination of arcs and then a combination of splines. Then we can actually use the, let's say, the shape of the spline to dictate rotation as well as specifying the rotation of an object over the length of a particular spline. Again, this is just the basic five. Uh, you can certainly layer on complexity uh, over time or as you become more experienced. So in this first example, you see our metal sphere in the background moving on a straight line up to the foreground. So in the image here, you see the box in the straight line, and here we uh, give it a chance to uh, introduce the track view. 
Uh, this is where you see the name of the object, its position is the attribute that we're looking at, and we can see X in red, excuse me, X in green, Y in red, and Z in blue that show the change of that box's location over space and time, right? The maximum time model here is 100 frames. Okay, so we're going to use a straight line. I'm making a 2D spline, start to end. Right mouse click to let go of the line. All right, so I don't need to move it actually. I'm going to change the midpoint of my sphere to five feet. I mean the elevation of the spline to five feet and then just confirm the elevation of my sphere. Yep. Okay, because I want it to move up here as if it's moving along the ground. So select the sphere. I want to assign the controller, expand that menu, hit p position, highlight that. Then that little checkbox comes up. Click. All right, look for path constraint. Hit OK. Now scroll down this menu, hopefully better than I will. There you go. Add path. Select that straight line. Notice the sphere moves, right, because look where I am in time. I s hit the slider, pull it back and forth. There goes my sphere. All right, now you can also play the viewport. And you can see that sphere over the 300 frames move at a constant rate of speed past the columns or the cylinders. Now, using the segmented spline, right, so here we go, there's our, our ball appears to bounce in space. We're using, right, here we're looking at the track view on a segmented, right, and our position of our object is controlled with, a, uh, with, a spl with this spline itself. For the number of frames that are in our model, it, in it moves that sphere along that line over the number of frames of the model. So it's a smooth movement here. What's nice to note is that you end up having these hollow boxes. These begin to identify uh, keyframes, right, uh, in the movement of our model, or excuse me, in the movement of our sphere over time. So you'll start to see that each keyframe in many ways is one of those vertices. We can then use the um, track view itself and we can begin to move these frames or these interpolation points and we can also change the speed. All right, so now we want to move our sphere using a segmented line. So first I'm going to make my line. If you can see I made a 2D spline segmented. Now let's make it a tad more interesting. Highlight the vertex, move some of these vertices up in the Z. I'm using the columns as a little bit of a, of a guide. So it'll go up and down. All right, cool. Deselect it. There's our sphere. Transform type in. Did it. Happy radius there at five. Move it up, which is kind of a nonsense step, but I did it anyway. So the sphere is highlighted. I'm going to go to the Motion Command Panel, Highlight Position, Mash on the button, Select Path Constraint, OK. OK, this is where I can't scroll down the menu, but anyway, I did. Add Path, Highlight that yellow path. Notice the sphere moves to the origin. And there, over the 300 frames, it moves rather quickly up and down.
Now we see our sphere moving smoothly along a spline, again interpolating right, the movement of that object over 100 frames, or 95 frames. You see the movement of the object at x, y, and z right, as it begins to change its location. So you'll see the name of the object, its position, and then its, lo the, its locations described graphically. For the beginning, the track view is not going to become too important, but um, as you start to layer in complex states, it's beca become an incredibly useful tool. So what's important to understand in this case is how to make a path, and then two, how to link that path to this uh, object in order to control its motion. All right, and I'm pretty clear with my repeated use of the term control. So the way to get started is one, select your object. So you see I've got a series of splines in here. I've got a, a plane and a couple of objects, a, a cone, a sphere, a cube. All right, so here's our sphere, it's selected. Once it's selected, we're gonna to go to number two, which is the motion command panel. We're going to highlight the position, X, Y, Z, because it's the position that we want to animate. But really what we want to do is control position. So under assign controller, highlight position, and then mash on the button here with a little check mark and the little, I don't know, orange clock. All right, so what this is, is it gives us a chance to tell the modeler how we want to control the motion. And we're going to control motion with the path constraint. So, you know, the fifth step is to highlight path constraint, mash on the OK button. Once you do that, you'll notice that in the command pan motion command panel further down, we see the path parameters. You're going to add a path. You select the path that's going to control the motion of the object. The object will automatically move to the start point of that spline or line. Its name will show up here. And this is where follow and bank, smoothness, constant velocity, this is how you can specify the movement of that sphere, sphere in time along that line segment. Okay, same thing, but I have a curved spline, it's highlighted, you see the vertices there. And the goal is to move my cone object, which is in green, along that spline. So highlight the cone, go to the command motion panel, position, assign the controller, because that's where we are. Yeah, hit the button, path constraint, okay. Scroll down, add the path, select our smoothie spline, there it is, right? Because look at where we are in the model. There's the origin. All right, so this is where you can have it follow. Now, it's not perfect every time, so I need to do a little bit of adjustment, which of course I do wrong. A few times, but I use the transform type in because I can't. I didn't feel comfortable judging. Uh, by eye in the viewport. Okay, got it right finally. Bank, so it'll sort of sort of rotate, oh, the cone is kind of round. But anyway, so here we go. It follows that spline. All right, so I can play that viewport and you can see our cone moving at a constant rate of speed following the spline.
All right, fine. So we're moving some objects and we're controlling their movement, but now we want to be able to control their uh, speed of motion. So uh, you can see in the illustration on the right, the left hand vox hypervoxel is moving at a constant rate. The distance between each of the voxels in space is actually equal versus the voxel to the right, which actually has the uh, hypersolids really close to one another, then they, the distance, right, so they're moving really slow, and then the distance gets really great, so it's moving super fast, and then it slows down when it gets to T1. So you can control this um, simply through keyframes, right, changing the distance and the time from, uh, which is what our exercise is going to be. But we can also change these rate and the move motion, right, and the speed of motion in the track view, but we'll leave that for another day. So rates of change. So we've got three spheres in the background moving up to the foreground. We've got a track view for each one of those spheres here over the 120 frames. This object, our first sphere, our foreground, moves at a constant rate from background to foreground over the 120 frames. Item number two moves, sphere number two moves super quick and then it's it, to the end point, right? And it achieves that distance in 80 frames. And if you go to the third example here, you can see that we've adjusted the curves, the motion curves, right, here in the track view and then it's moving relatively uniformly here, right? And then it speeds up as it gets there. So if we look at the animation, so here we are, there's the, the background sphere is moving at a constant rate. The middle sphere is also moving at a constant rate. And then the other moves really fast and then it moves really slow. You know what? This is the middle, this is the foreground one, and this is the middle one. All right, ground fore and aft. All right, fair enough. So what you need to do for the, the third sketch in uh, this week's assignment is, is that you need to do some math, which is calculate the using the formula distance equals rate times time. You have to solve the equation for time, right? Because we're talking about the uh, time model in our max models using frames per second. All right, so you gotta solve for time. Time is expressed as frames, and the rate is expressed as feet per frame. You need to configure the time model right, based upon the worst case scenario, that being the slowest object in the scene. In this instance, right, it's the walk, it's the walk object. So the walk object is moving at three miles per hour or 0.146 feet per frame. So what you gotta do is this, move three spheres or three pieces of geometry over 300 feet at three different rates of speed. So one will be at walk, one will be at run or jog, and the third will be at 30 miles per hour. I do not need a full length animation of the geometry moving from uh, the walking animation. All we need to do is see the frames for, and the objects moving in space for the um, drive or run or jog uh, situation. All right, good luck. Okay, people, this moves kind of fast. So hit auto key. Go to the end of your time model. Okay, that's the number of frames it takes for my poor sphere to travel 300 feet. Hit auto key, move it to the end of the 300 feet. Uncheck auto key and then confirm it well, save and then confirm it by hitting the slider and see and make sure that our sphere travels. Okay, so this is the middle, twice the rate of speed. Our cube goes twice the rate of speed as our green. So it will go to the end of the 300 feet. Notice auto keys checked, move it, uncheck auto key, and then hit the slider, and there we go. All right, 
now the cone moves at 10 times the rate of the green sphere. So I go to that frame, move my cone, set auto key, move the cone, uncheck auto key, and then check it on the slider. So 10 times as fast. Good. Activate one of the viewports, play it, confirm that it is correct. And there you go. Fast cone, slow sphere. The end.